Thank you all for joining us for this today. This is really exciting. We did a webinar last week about Reg CF crowdfunding. And so this is definitely a companion piece to that. We will be talking about digital marketing today. And we invite you guys to join us as much as you like through the chat today, throw your questions in throughout and we will be incorporating those. You can also use the Q&A box, but we're really happy that you're here and we wanna make this as interactive as possible. We have an amazing, amazing panel for you today, a panel of experts. We have Danny Shapuri, who is the sales manager at Digital Niche Agency. We have Sarah Bradbury, who's the content marketer at Digital Niche Agency. And we have Jessica Baker, who is the founder of Lives Align and Adeline. And they're gonna tell you all about um, what they do and their specialties. And this panel, again, will be hosted by the one and only Brad Hamilton, who is the founder and editor of the Hatch Institute. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Brad. Thank you so much, Rivka, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, glad that you are here and joining us uh, for this presentation about digital marketing. Uh, I'm a longtime journalist, and I can tell you that I'm hardly breaking news when I say that a compelling digital presence is absolutely necessary for the success of any business, right? So how you convey what you're all about uh, on your own website, across your social media platform, uh, is, the, is the key to creating a customer base and driving revenue. So that basic understanding of digital marketing at this very moment is all the more important because of the emergence of Reg CF crowdfunding, which uh, Rivka was just referencing and was the subject of our webinar last week. Um, and also the reason why today's session is such a compliment to what we covered in that event. You're not aware of it if you didn't uh, happen to uh, attend last week's webinar or seen a, a recording of it. Um, you should know that Reg CF is relatively new and a super powerful way for businesses to raise uh, substantial funding uh, through through the support of their customers, uh, who basically invest in your operation on favorable terms for you. Uh, one of the panelists last week called them investors, uh, and the rules have uh, recently changed so you can raise as much as five million through Reg CF crowdfunding. Uh, and these raises are becoming really increasingly popular uh, among small businesses as, as, as a turnaround tool uh, in this recovery process post pandemic. So having said all that, as a, and as attractive as Reg CF raises can be, um, they are not successful unless you as the owner of a business put in the time and the effort to create a great digital marketing plan. Um, one that you know, energizes those who love your business and encourage them encourages them to become uh, stakeholders. So how do you do that exactly? Uh, when it comes to digital marketing and digital planning, what are the steps that you need to take? I'm gonna start right away with Sarah Bradley. Uh, she knows a lot about this subject. And so let's begin with some fundamentals. Sarah, what, what is, first of all, welcome. And secondly, what is the most important thing do you think uh, a person should think about when launching a, a digital campaign? Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so there are three things that I do highly recommend when launching a digital marketing campaign. The first one is presence. The second one is consistency. And then the third one is themes. So the key to content marketing for any business uh, or brand is maintaining a presence, consistency, or conveying your brand voice through tested themes um, and proven themes. So content is king. Content funnels allow customers to interact with brands beyond the web page or app. So it's a great way to support and grow a community and the best way to establish peer-to-peer -peer marketing. So it's the modern day version of word of mouth, essentially. So social media marketing is essential for businesses of all sizes, um, from interacting with people where they are to prospecting leads. Uh, social platforms provide excellent tools for increasing uh, just brand messaging as a whole. So when you say consistency, what you mean is mm -hmm. that you that, that it's incumbent upon the business owner um, to be consistent with what that person is saying across not just their own website, but all of these platforms. There needs to be a consistency in the theme, in the messaging of what they're saying on all of these platforms. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So consistent content marketing helps position your brand and company for growth and then allows for you to capture elements of your brand's messaging through that content. Um, now, I think one thing that we can think about a little bit is um, that 
that sometimes people feel a, that it's a burden to be constantly paying attention to all these different outlets. I've got to say something on Twitter. I've got to say something on my Insta page. We've got to post right. something on the web page. Are there, are there ways that you can sort of help yourself? Are there tools for that sort of thing? Yes. So there's a variety of social media applications that can help with scheduling. Um, so I know that it can seem daunting at first, but these applications are created for uh, businesses like this. Um, or small businesses. So there's applications like Sprout Social, there's one called later.com, um, there's one called Hootsuite and Buffer. So there's many others out there, but these applications can also provide important information as far as impressions and reach and engagement um, for each piece of social media content that you produce or post. So it makes it really e uh, easy to A-B test content with your audience to see what's working and what's not working. Excellent. So you talked a little bit about themes. Um, can you expand on that? What kind of, what kind of themes are you talking about uh, that will help you as you build your digital presence? So when creating content or brainstorming themes for a content calendar or a future content calendar, I try to stick with um, a specific list of tried and proven themes. So this has worked for regulation, crowdfunding, small businesses as a whole. Um, so I always stick with these. These are my absolute, um, it's like my Bible essentially for when I create themes. So I would say, team background and advisors is very important. So you highlight the previous professional success of the founders. Um, so this is even more so if you've had a previous exit or you've worked for big companies in your industry before. Um, there's founders traction, which is also important. So showcasing your founders expertise, CEO expertise, um, any traction or any press that the founder has had previously or currently. Um, growth charts. So if there's any projected growth from quarter one to quarter two, that's always nice for customers to see or potential investors to see as well. There is the under the hood theme. So that works well for technology companies or entertainment companies. Um, customer testimonials, those are huge. So those highlight success stories that you've had uh, for people that have had the real problem that you've helped fix with your product or with your business. Um, there's also an investor Q&A or a client Q&A. So that's something that you can do that's recorded. You can have a video testimonial. You can repurpose that on YouTube. You can repurpose it in an email newsletter or a blog. Um, highlight your strategic partnerships as well. So why these uh, partners chose to partner with you, how these partnerships will create value in the future. Um, covering your valuation and explaining how you formulated your valuation and providing relevant industry context for that as well. That, Any media? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any yeah, media? Sounds Go ahead, talk a little bit about media, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Uh, so media, so any press or big announcements that you've had, it's always important to highlight that for your customers as well, just showing that there is traction, that the company is doing well. Um, and then just unique problems and how you solve it, uh, what differentiates you from your competitors, essentially. So these themes are always something that has been tried and true, has worked every single time for me. So that's that's what I use. It sounds like what you're saying is digital is basically a branding effort, and, and that's a very technical term, in my view, for essentially telling the world uh, who you are, what your story is, how you built your business. Uh, those are the kinds of things that people tend to respond to, yes? Yes, yes. So it is very important to have a brand top of mind. So the more that you can connect with others in a personal and emotional or a meaningful way, the more credible and legitimate your business is and becomes in the consumer's mind. Excellent. That is an excellent overview. Um, maybe we'll bring in Danny here. Uh, Danny, you've done uh, a lot of this sort of work with clients. Um, can you give us some ideas about how to best plan uh, a digital strategy? You know, how do you spark that investor interest? Great question, Brad. So there's a few ways we, we look at it and fundamentals, to any type of marketing as a whole, we were big on planning it out. The, the research, we're able to, you know, identify any holes before the campaign is live, where it's much more difficult to make those type of changes when there's, you know, thousands of investors that are looking at it. Uh, so what we do is we'll spend a whole four to six weeks uh, with issuers that aren't currently live. So we can do a whole micro, macro of the industry. We're then looking at, you know, direct and indirect competitors. So anyone that's looking through to the same investor audience, uh, that will be targeting, uh, you know, there's a saying success leaves clues so we can, you know, lean off their shoulders and, you know, not have to reinvent the wheel, see what's working for them as far as frequency goes and messaging. We then map out their personas, psychographics, demographics, household income, 
And then from there, mapping out what that content funnel looks like, which is shares, uh, you know, emphasis is on is really look at that as that the investor funnel, the, the brand voice. Uh, and then from there, you know, what traffic channels we're going to do, pr- uh, projections and timelines. So we know what's going to reach what as far as the performance goes. And then a B2B strategic outreach uh, type of a partnership list. Uh, these are the key components we found to be successful in that formula for these raises. That sounds that sounds like a lot, and it sounds very interesting and detailed. Um, certainly, just to get some people up to speed in case you're not fully aware of what a, C, a Reg CF a raise is all about, you're essentially going out to the world and you're asking your customers, your investors, uh, to support your business by um, uh, giving you money, and that money then converts into some type of either a profit sharing or a percentage of the business. So as you do that, you're essentially gathering a large crowd of people, getting them excited, not just about your product and your company, but also about participating as a stakeholder. Um, so these are the kinds of elements that you're talking about, Danny, uh, where you're, you're actually using these tools uh, to, to get those people to participate. Uh, one thing that I think some people might worry about is, well, geez, that's a lot of stuff to try to digest. You know, you're talking about all these various aspects that um, analyze what's happening, what you're doing online and whether or not it's working. Um, what about as far as just, you know, the individual business owner, you know, what kinds of things can they do, do you think, to help, uh, help the effort and complement, um, you know, the metrics and the measurables that you're uh, applying to how the raise is going? Yeah, so in regards to metrics and the strategy, the reason I like the strategy is it puts us all in sync. Uh, you know, not every founder has an, an internal team to take certain sections of it. Some do. Some are already working with another agency for certain sections of it. And we just want to make sure you know, everything is being implemented uh, for success. And, you know, building out that funnel, making sure the branding is on point, and then measuring through an algorithm through ads themselves. We're able to see how many people we serve an ad to, how many then clicked on that ad. From there, how that landing page is performing as far as conversions go, investments in the scenario, and then the return on ad spend uh, as we're able to measure how much revenue capital has been driven through those ads. And then from there, it can be very systematic and data driven um, based on those analytics and be conclusive with our recommendations based on that real time data. Got and then it. can scale from there safely. So one of the other things that we talked about last time is that the uh, is the importance of the portal, the 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 essentially your partner in launching um, uh, a a Reg CF uh, raise. But you know the the digital side is also a, a partner. So uh, can you give us a little bit of a sense of how you go about deciding which of these uh, portal funding services are right for you as a business? Yeah, absolutely, a great question. So there there are you know. I would say there's there's a big four. We're looking at you know Seed Invest, Start Engine, Republic, WeFunder. There's some smaller portals as well that you know aren't playing as many. They're not as many live campaigns, so you may get a lot more hand holding in that scenario. And, and you know we we try to make the intros for issuers to those individuals that you know we have contacts with the portals and ask them to make you know some educated questions around you know, what type of uh, customer service they can expect, what type of deliverables when they hit certain parts of their raise, will they be emailing their internal list as well? Because these portals have this data of these investors uh, and it pulls a lot of weight and it's that peer-to-peer play. Uh, So you want to be asking those questions and then really see how comfortable you feel with that individual that you'll be working with within those portals. You know, you'll notice that, uh, you know, some will provide more recommendations ongoing, hold your hand through the whole form C, get everything set up for you as far as the messaging goes and compliance. Uh, and some may be a little more limited because they have so many issuers that are live at that given moment. So they're not able to put as much attention on, on one particular raise. Got it. So it sounds like once you're happy with the, the, the portal that you found, you, you then bring in a, 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 perhaps a digital co- a company to help you plan um, can you can you give us a sort of a, an idea of what these plans look like? 
I mean, how do you how do you how do you map out a time frame? What's the first? What's the second? What's the third thing that you do? How does it go typically for a client who's going to do this? Yeah, so on the marketing side, we'll, we'll typically do that four week strategy with them. Um, from there, we like to analyze what's the best scenario for activation. Some brands are a lot farther along than others. Some are just starting. Uh, so we may want to build an audience. We may want to build out a, a digital footprint through content beforehand. So it doesn't look like we just started. There's not that empty restaurant feeling. There's more of a community. Uh, there's that saying, if there's no crowd, there's no crowd raise. So we want to be able to build out a, a community. And the beauty of the new extensions from the 15th, we could actually do what's called test the waters. Uh, it's reservations. It's like a letter of intent, basically, where uh, it, investors are committing to saying they're going to invest a certain amount when the campaign actually goes live. And the beauty of that as an agency, we can actually test out, you know, creative, we can then get some analytics on what audiences are performing. It's also a social proof component. You know, if you have 75 or 7.5 million in reservations, we could actually have that in the creative, the ad copy. It's going to carry a lot of weight. Um, and this comes from Reg A plus that they then move to, Reg CF, which is awesome. Um, and it gives us the ability to be more intentional when the actual race goes live. Uh, so I anticipate that uh, going a lot further. But yeah, it's case by case. If a brand has a good amount of community that they're already post revenue, have a customer list, you know, in the thousands, they may not need as much pre launch efforts. But it sounds like when it comes to effort, it does sound like there's a lot of, of time and energy that is required um, of the business owner. Um, they're not just handing all of this off to these partners that they've hired, but they have to get involved themselves. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you say about that as far as the, the work element, the commitment from the business owner? Can't stress this one enough. The, the, more, the founders that are more involved are the ones that I see typically hit the higher levels in their race. They're reaching out to different publishers. They're reaching out to friends they haven't talked to in 30 years around uh, from high school, where they're, you know, asking them to invest and share with their friends. Um, that initial uh, performance is going to help the ads to scale. Uh, we want to make sure that, you know, I can't stress the empty restaurant feeling enough. Campaigns that, you know, launch right out the gate that are at that 100k level or higher are going to see historically a, a higher conversion rate from these active investors that would be targeting to their offering and that's just based on data uh, where groups that go start before that may struggle a bit more right out the gate because there's not as much trust in that early momentum but to answer your question the more active we have clients uh, we had a client popcom who got on uh, the breakfast club there's more traffic than in the funnel uh, they were at a 15x for the two reg CF campaigns with a uh, return on ad spend, uh, which is substantially high for these raises. And, and she was very committed to doing as much as she can for more traffic in that funnel and bring their own audience as well. So we're all working as an extension of each other's teams and, and really be able to get that to a good point where we can scale the ads and hit our cap at a faster timeline. It sounds it sounds good. It sounds also like what what you put in is what you get out. Uh, let let me let me bring in Jessica here. Uh, you've you've had some of these same experiences. You know, you're working with clients. Can you give us some uh, some of your insights? What are what are the what are the uh, keys? Do you think what are some of the success, successful uh, examples that you have from your experience about how clients can can get involved and and be successful in this type of uh, digital marketing for a raise? Yeah, no, definitely. I, I definitely think that, like Danny was saying, the more involved, the more success, the 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 scale of how successful you're going to be is is definitely related. Um, so just being ready and available, um, you know, going out and doing what you have to do to um, get that you know, reaching out to people that you, you need to speak to that you haven't spoken to in a while. Um, yeah, just thinking of everybody as, you know, you're offering them an opportunity, right? You're not asking them for money, you're offering them an opportunity to, um, to see more value out of their, out of their, their money. Um, so just kind of thinking about it like that, rather than thinking about like, oh my gosh, I have to go to my friend and I have to ask them for something. And I haven't spoken to them in years. You're like, I'm reaching out to you because, I genuinely believe in this and I want you to be part of it because I think we can both win together. 
Um, and I thought of you because, um, you know, this is something that we found synergy, you know, as kids and, and this would be great if you jumped on board and maybe we can reconnect. Um, so just kind of going out there and thinking it in that kind of mindset rather than, you know, you know, I, I need, I need money. I need to, I need to do, you know, do well and I need to get to this next goal. It's actually, you know, that they believe in you. And then just really um, when you pose that question or you talk to them getting feedback, right? So, um, Another thing that I've found successful with people is like, if I go around to my family and my friends um, or coworkers or anybody, and I say, Hey, you know, what do you really, you know, what do you think about this project that I'm working on? What do you think about this business that I'm doing? They can say, Oh, you're doing great. You know, they want to be 100% supportive. They're like, Oh, it's wonderful. I'm so proud of you. That's great. And as, as much as that's, you know, wonderful for the ego, um, it might not translate to actual, uh, you know, what's in the bank account. So what I found to be helpful is if I go to them and I say, Hey, you know, I'd really love your feedback on, uh, you know, which two things resonates for you the most, you know, option A or option B. Um, and then, okay, well, if option B resonates with you the most, then, um, you know, what would it take to get you, uh, invested in option B? Um, where are you at today? And just generally dive into um, the quality kind of feedback that you're looking for. Not just like, oh, you're doing great, but like, you know, do they really believe in what you're doing? And um, if they don't, then some great constructive feedback so that you can really resonate with not just them, but also uh, people that maybe you don't know. It's a really interesting perspective. It sounds like you're talking about, you know, the, the, that there are, there are parallels between when you launch a business before you actually start a business and when you launch a digital strategy, right? You're talking to people about it in advance. You're getting them excited. You know, you're not, you, you're trying to get in your, the headspace of, no, I need money rather than, hey, listen, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be including you because I've thought of you. And I'm going to make a lot of money doing this. And I want you to participate in that success, uh, but also being very specific about what you ask them um, so that you can get use, not just useful information back from them, but you can get them to be thinking about your business and how it's going to grow, which is, I guess, part of that conversion strategy from just a friend who supports you and says, great, good luck to, hey, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to put in a thousand bucks or 5,000 bucks into your business. Is that, is that absolutely is that Absolutely. Get them thinking like an investor, you know, because then you'll get, um, you know, there's your, there's your focus group. Right. And, um, and, you know, I'd rather be the kind of person that somebody, somebody tells me that I have tissue on my shoe before I walk out the door rather than walking out the door. You really want people to give you that feedback and maybe, you know, because it's so close to your heart, what you're working on, you're spending your your time, energy, effort, money on this project, um, you know, it might be hard to receive some of those comments, but ultimately it's for your benefit. It's ultimately what you want so that you do walk out the door with no tissue on your shoe, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, Danny, you talked before about uh, Facebook ads. So I, this, is, this is something that I think is interesting since Facebook ads do play a fairly critical role, it sounds like in a, in a digital campaign. I'll open that up to any of you guys who want to just sort of jump in and talk about the importance of Facebook ads. Yeah, uh, we, we found Facebook ads and Instagram, which you buy Facebook or Instagram inventory from Facebook to be one of the biggest drivers for these campaigns uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one, we're able to track all the way through on the algorithm. Uh, it's really easy to place what's called a pixel um, on the back end of these portals, which then gives us all the measurements for reporting and be able to showcase what metrics we're seeing and, and most importantly, be able to optimize on what's working. Uh, where other channels, if we're not able to, to see that all the way through, we're just optimizing on front end metrics uh, and you know we're a bit more blind. Uh, and on top of that, as an agency, we've been building a lot of first party data of these active investor audiences uh, we've done over 200 of these fundraising campaigns and have first party data partners along with that as well. Uh, so we're targeting active investor audiences that invested in these campaigns beforehand. They already know about the portals. They know about Reg CF. They're familiar in the space. So we're targeting more warm audiences versus trying to you know, educate them on what crowdfunding is, uh, which would be more of a colder audience. So we, we tend to see higher performance from that. 
and, um, and most importantly, gives us ability to scale. And we shoot for a five to 10 X uh, return on ad spend. We've had some clients with the reg CF up to 31 X. I wouldn't say that's as common, um, but we're in that five to 10 X space. That's where we, we know we can scale safely. Meaning that the, it'll be a correlation between the actual scaling of the budget and the investments uh, with that pacing increase. Interesting. So, so when it comes to those metrics, you know, uh, you launch the cam that campaign gets started. You've you've placed some Facebook ads. Maybe you're working on Insta. Well, how what are the things that you look for to indicate how it's going? The average gift, the number of investors, page views. What what kind of metrics are at the top of your list as far as uh, evaluating how things are going? Yes. Yeah, so, in regards to metrics, uh, we're we're really looking at the return on ad spend as a whole which is basically going to tie into how much is being invested from those audiences that are coming from ads. And then from there, you know, if we're seeing, you know, strong return, we we can then scale. If we're not, we then need to go back into the whole algorithm and see where the performance is dropping. For example, if the click-through rate on the creative is low, we know we need to change the creative. Uh, If the cost per thousand impressions, CPM, uh, is too high, we know we need to uh, include a traffic campaign which is designed to create more traffic into that funnel. Uh, we know retargeting is going to be the bigger audience that performs at the higher level because we found these aren't impulse conversions, meaning uh, you know it's a security. They have to hold it typically for a year or longer. Um, so being able to uh, know that you know the larger retargeting audience we have, meaning bringing people back to the campaign that have already visited that didn't convert, uh, we're historically going to see higher performance from that, uh, which – it gets us more intentional right out the gate. Uh, but yeah, those are the metrics, the cost per click, the cost per thousand impressions, the click-through rate, which then gives us the performance of the landing page. And then the main KPIs, key performance indicators will be that return on ad spent and then the acquisition of those investors. So we call that the CPA. Well, it sounds like that's that's a pretty sophisticated way of analyzing what's happening. And it sounds like you can also course correct if things are not going well. Um, I want to I want to kick it back to Sarah for just a minute because I think that sort of fundamentally um, before before all of this can actually work, it sounds like you you really do need to get one's digital uh, uh, presence uh, up to speed so that it's all right and tight. And I, I guess as a business owner, probably there are some people who are wondering like how much is that going to cost? How long will it take? You know, what, what is the typical, typical kind of process when you're working with a client um, who maybe doesn't have it quite all working together uh, on, the, on the themes that you're talking about or in the consistency mm-hmm. that's required across uh, the various platforms? Right. So the most important aspect of marketing is consistency. So that's absolutely the most important always. So whether that's consistent with one social media account or multiple social media accounts, Uh, with one weekly newsletter, with one monthly blog post. Um, Successful marketing for crowdfunding or for your small business would need to include a few separate things. So you would need your clear value proposition. So you would need a landing page. You would need a solid product, of course, solid team and uh, solid social proof. So social proof we established through content marketing, through social media marketing. Um, So building the social proof does include creating the engaging content. So that could be videos or blogs or social media posts, email newsletters, um, and of course, some community management. Um, So it's important to garner trust with your current audience in order to further build out your sphere of influence or potential future customers. Um, So if a customer or consumer sees social proof, then this will establish trust with your brand and your product. Um, But it it does seem a little bit daunting, but to to make the process easier, stick with one theme. You can build that theme out multiple times. So let's say you choose to do um, the advisors or the background of the team. You can create that into a article. You can turn that into a press release. You can make that into an email announcement and then you can create multiple social media posts just through that one, um, that one theme. So if you build that out with multiple themes, then it'll be a lot easier to create a, uh, a content calendar for whichever month you're working for. Got it. 
Okay. I mean, I think, I think we've gotten the basics. I'd, I'd love to hear from you guys about, you know, a sort of sample campaign. You know, you talk about the four week strategy, maybe you're looking for a, a typical raise is in the, in the range of 250 to 500,000. Um, so just, can you talk through what it would take, you know, how, how the process works for a client who's in that position, let's say they've worked with someone like Sarah, they've, they've gotten that consistency, they've created some, some good content, um, they're, they're, they've been posting, they're generating all of this, now they're, now they're involved in a raise, and just give us, give us a little bit of a, a sort of a walkthrough, maybe Jessica, you can address this one, like, what's it like, this four-week strategy, I want to raise 250, I want to raise 300,000, so how does it how does it sort of play out uh, in a timeline kind of way? Let me just unmute myself. <laughs> um, <clears throat> in a timeline kind of way, uh, you are always very very busy. Um, you you don't do much sleeping. Um, <laughs> no, um, you're you're definitely going back and forth a lot with um, with people like like Sarah and Danny to just make sure that what is being conveyed is actually in line with your, um, with your company, you know, just because they say, you know, Oh, red, red could be read the book or read the color. Right. So just making sure that conveying that message and it's being received in a way that is accurate for your company is, is super important. Um, but yeah, the timeline, it just, it feels like a, a long blur of days, um, where you're just constantly going back and forth, um, with one another and, uh, and being available so that you can get the most success out of it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's like, it's like exam finals time in my mm. mind. So, <laughs> um, so, but, but maybe regarding like the specific milestones and whatnot, maybe Dana can touch more on that. Yeah. And I love how Jessica mapped out, you know, the whole process. We, we do say like, you know, it's the busiest six months, 12 months of your life, you know, it's make or break. The campaigns are so public. So you know, they're looking for, you know, that leadership from that founding team, uh, even if it's just a one man army. Uh, so being able to have that all, all mapped out. And then, yeah, milestones are huge. So that could be a partnership, that could be an interview with a, you know, VC or angel or just a, a retail investor that you're able to repurpose and content. Uh, there's also a, a, uh, an update section on most of the portals. And what that does is it's going to, you know, notify the people that are watching the campaign. It's going to notify the investors. We can see people coming back and investing more as a repeat investor. Uh, you we want to be as creative as possible. And it, it doesn't mean you need substantial wins every week. But I would try to find a way to, to have an update weekly or at least every two weeks. Uh, it's going to be able to create that momentum, that milestones. It's going to build excitement and, you know, people have that FOMO where they need to get in, which then is going to create more urgency. Uh, and uh, you want to be able to be creative about that. And there's no one strategy, but we live in that whole test, optimize and scale. So once you have data, you can see where that lift's coming from, for what content's resonating best uh, with that audience. So a reg CF raise has a cap of one year. So you have one year to raise raise the money that you're after. You set the goal, you set the terms, you launch, you do this intensive uh, um, campaign. You're, you're involved fully, you're watching it, you're tracking it, you're working with your partners in this, which is the portal, which is the people like yourself who are digital experts who are helping you with that. Um, but what sort of typically is the, 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 uh, the back end of it? How long does it take typically uh, for a, a raise to meet its goals? So I, I will say normally from what we see is like a, we usually try to have clients at least do a three month minimum on a month to month basis for us. Uh, I have seen some, I mean, I would say there's 1% that I've seen do maybe like it in the first week or the first month hit their hard cap, which in the past was a million 70. Uh, as of the 15th, it's now 5 million. So we'll, I know there's, I know of one that's hit the 5 million since that happened. Uh, and uh, as far as timelines go, I mean, yeah, we've seen some reg CF campaigns that you know, have done the whole year and they're, you know, slowly but surely getting to the goal they want. Uh, it's more of a marathon than a sprint. We always say, uh, you know, there are going to be good weeks. There's going to be slower weeks. There's so many things that factor into performance uh, and, you know, some see performance right out the gate on the ads as well. And some, you know, we have to test out a bit more to really be conclusive on where we can scale. 
So those are a few things, you know, anyone should factor in and really look at as a long term. And now with the $5 million cap, I anticipate more groups doing the longer raises, you know, for that full year, because uh, if it's working, why not continue? Uh, and then they'll, you know, refile and do another raise. We've had some groups do five raises with us, uh, you know, to date. So they're, you know, it's that always be raising momentum. I think some people who, who are considering jumping in with this, they, they, they know it's going to be a, a, a marathon, not a sprint. They know it's going to take a lot of commitment from them. I think one of the bottom line sort of questions that many people might have is, well, how much should I really invest in this? What exactly is the dollar ROI on this? If I put in 20,000 or 30,000, that's a fair amount of capital to risk. You know, and, and, and am I going to get that 10x, that 12x back? Am I going to actually get to three or 400,000? What, what, what can you tell us about that, that type of experience, those types of ROI numbers? Yeah, so for on our end, you know, and I try not to overpromise. I'm coming that philosophy of like, you know, really being the best marketers are problem solvers, in my opinion. But what the portal suggests, the main portals, is around 10% of what you're looking to raise to go into full marketing. And what a lot of issuers do is what's called a rolling close. Uh, so they're able to pull money out at, at once they hit a certain level in their raise and then reinvest that into, um, into their marketing services and other uh, areas where they need to focus on, whether that's uh, team members, et cetera, around the business. Uh, but we usually stick to those numbers. I've seen some groups do substantially less, meaning they, they had a great start right out the gate, you know, and only had to raise a certain amount through ads because that early momentum and they really built, built out their community to come in that day it launched. So, you, you know, substantially at a higher level when starting, so less amount needs to be raised to hit those levels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I can give some examples. I mean, uh, I can keep mentioning Popcom, who's actually Larry Von Start Engine right now of their Reg A. Uh, we worked on their Reg A, uh, two of their Reg CF campaigns. Uh, we usually start with them at like 300K. Uh, and as I mentioned, they're at that 15X. So they're much lower in, in what they have had to do on those Reg CF campaigns. Their Reg A has been a bit more, uh, a bit different than their Reg CFs. Uh, a reggae plus is, and I'll just give a, a background on the differences. So a reggae plus is basically 80% of an IPO filing. And what we have to do there is we're, we're uh, targeting accredited and unaccredited, just like a reg CF. How under, under reggae plus, you can raise up to 75 million. It was 50 before the, the 15th. And um, reg CF, obviously it's at uh, 5 million now. So those are the main differences. And then the uh, the actual filing cost is much more significant because you can raise more. So the SEC makes you go through a lot more to be approved on those. Um, and yeah, you know, uh, I would say those are some good, you know, scenarios to reference. And, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see what other, you know, the panelists have to, to share on this, on um, what they've seen on their end. Yeah, I mean, I just just for regular crowdfunding, I've seen, I mean, if you want to go on the low end, so you're not scared with some of those numbers that Danny was stating, <laughs> if you, you know, normal, regular people that are trying to raise, say, a million, um, I've, you know, started out with like 10,000, for example, and then just as, as capital got raised, just reinvested and reinvested, and you can raise, you know, uh, a million with, with a $50,000 investment. So um, all that is extremely reasonable and, uh, you know, just, you know, putting out your own uh, initial capital might be 10,000. And then just know that as, as, the, uh, as the platform grows, you can take a little bit out and reinvest it into um, to, to, to the campaign. So you don't feel like it's constantly just draining on you. Um, you can immediately real time log on anytime and see, you know, how it's doing and where it's going. And um, so and that, in my opinion, is very exciting um, because there's transparency and um, you can feel good about it and it'll make you more excited to do more. Um, but yeah, just I would say initially out of the gate, it's probably good to have 10,000 in your pocketbook to be able to dedicate to this and then just uh, trust that you can you know, take a little bit out as more, more, camp, uh, more of the campaign grows and, um, you know, easily get to that goal um, with obviously with your energy and effort and dedication with your team to, um, to meet those milestones. Cool. 
Sounds good. Um, it's interesting. We had we had an uh, we had a question that came in that I found intriguing um, because it speaks to an element of this, which is you can't have crowdfunding without a crowd. You have to build an audience. But in this case, um, the, the 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 participant is saying, "Listen, I, there are there are a lot of companies out there that I love more companies than I can actually support." Uh, by getting involved in one of these raises. So how do I help a company, right, that, that I want to support, but that I can't actually give money to? And that sort of, to me, that sort of speaks a little bit about um, this building a crowd, building excitement, building enthusiasm uh, within, your, within your supporters of the business kind of group. Maybe, Sarah, you want to talk about that a little bit? I can speak to it. So what it sounds like from the question is that... Um, the person asking the question wants to support, but is not able to financially support, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I would do, or my suggestion would be share that that company's social media to all of your social medias, just there's a button that you can share. There's a share button on Facebook, a share button on Instagram, a share button all over the place. So as long as you share that to your social channels, that will post and you'll, all of your audience that already follows you will see that. Uh, maybe there's somebody else that follows you already that would relate to it and then would also be willing to share that post or information about the company. So it's about word of mouth. Social media gets that word of mouth out way quicker. Um, and then there will be the chain reaction of more people who will share that information as well. Um, hopefully it will be the same kind of sphere of influence that you um, are interested in being a part of, but that would be my suggestion. Uh, speaking of sphere of influence, is there mm -hmm. a, a kind of a minimum number of fans of a business, for example, I don't know, uh, followers on Instagram or followers on Twitter or number of people who are Facebook uh, subscribers? Are there are there numbers? Are there uh, figures that you look at to say this is a healthy uh, community that you can really tap into or you should probably start growing your community first before you get involved in uh, you know, a time consuming, and expensive raise that could really help the business, but you might not be quite ready for it yet. What, what are your so, thoughts? Friends and family are your first sphere of influence always that goes for crowdfunding, that goes for marketing, that goes for really anything as far as support goes. If you look at your LinkedIn contacts, all of those people are connections. Those are all potential uh, clients, potential um, investors. So always start with friends and family is what I would say. That's kind of a good rule of thumb. Um, and then branch out into who's already following you, invite them to uh, visit your page or visit this page that you're passionate about, um, and then just share it out that way. So there isn't really a set number, uh, as long as you have about 20% of the people that actually follow you. So if you have 100 followers, you have 20, 20 of them that are actually engaging with your content. So liking, commenting, sharing, all you need is 20%. So if you have 20% that's actually engaged, then you're good. If you have 1% that's engaged, that's not so good. But if you have 20% out of your 100, then that's great. So I would, I would, say, I would say that. So that rate is sort of uh, um, an indicator. You know, it's a, it's a scalable uh, metric, if you will. Mm -hmm. You're getting that kind of content reaction, which means people are listening to what you're saying. They're believing in your passion. Uh, they're following you. Sh they're sharing your content. And that kind of engagement is what is critical to, uh, well, in general, to a successful digital uh, uh, presence, but also specifically for uh, a, a reg CF raise. Mm -hmm. Precisely. Um, uh, just one quick point, Danny, you mentioned a couple of times reg A and reg CF. Can you sort of explain uh, the difference between those two? Yeah, sure. And, and just to emphasize, there's some portals that specifically work with Regsia. I mean, they're exclusive to it, just like Reg A. There's some port, uh, some portals that specifically work with that. I mean, one Regsia portal that we partner with, is Title Three Funds, they only focus on Reg CF campaigns. So you can always look for that as well. But the main difference is the actual filing and how much you can raise as a whole uh, before the fifteenth. March 15th this month, it was uh, at, under Reg A, it was 50 million. Uh, some lar most larger brands we find doing the Reg A is just because uh, it is 80% to 90% of an IPO filing. So there's a lot more audits you need to go through, a lot more legal. Um, some clients, it takes a year just to get that approval from the SEC, uh, where regulation, crowdfunding, Reg CF, you're able to, as of before the 15th, cap out at a million seventy now it's five million 
Uh, so I, I anticipate much larger brands getting involved in that because it's a, a big vehicle to raise up to five million, uh, where in the past it was a million seventy. But the main difference is the filing, uh, the financials that you're going to have to submit, uh, the timelines. Now you can do reservations in both campaigns, which is awesome uh, as of the recent changes. But I would say those are like the main differences between the two, uh, and. You know, there's a lot of groups that come from rewards crowdfunding as well that then do equity crowdfunding. And they're bringing that audience from backers to investors. And, and uh, if you're able to update them, deliver the product, you're going to have a lot of community there to be successful in your next race. Do you think it's important to do a rewards campaign, um, you know, not just to measure what the level of interest is, but also to kind of build a community before you launch a Reg CF campaign? Yeah, Brad, you nailed it. So proof of concept, that's huge. Uh, two, um, I've seen it make or break groups. So if you don't deliver your product, you're not updating those backers on where things are at. Some groups get delayed, most do. Uh, but if you're able to communicate in a timely fashion and they're able to, to know what's going on, if they don't, it may they we do see a lot of trolls. People are upset. You know, it's like they're, you know, you haven't updated us, but you're asking for more money now. You're doing a whole nother raise. So those are some things you want to consider. You want to be as transparent as possible. Uh, you want to have them as your, your brand ambassadors. That's really what, I mean, they could be an army either way. They could be for you or against you. So you want to be able to emphasize that. And yeah, I have groups that have done that uh, well, I've seen it work for them in their favor because they have that audience, they have that community, and it's only scaling from there as their next offering, which would be equity raise. I like this idea of communication. Like it sort of dovetails with uh, Sarah, what you were saying about consistency. You know, it's time consuming to constantly be updating people and and constantly be there waving the flag and cheerleading for your effort. Um, but it sounds like that is a really important part of the whole process. What do you say about this, Jessica? Have you seen kind of that sort of people flagging as far as, far as their enthusiasm goes and not just like keeping up and really communicating and being strong on a daily basis with their community? Yes. And I, you know, I'm, I'm more of an, for, for myself, I'm more of an introvert. So I like to just kind of keep my head down and focus on what I have to do. So that was like a, that was definitely my weak area um, that I've realized um, needs to be stronger because at the end of the day, you know, when you're, when you're invested in something, you also, you know, your, your people might also get a little emotional about it. And when you're feeling a little bit emotional, you don't want somebody to just ignore you um, <clears throat> cause that just can make things a lot worse. Right. So just, you know, human to human uh, just, you know, saying, Hey, you know, it might feel uncomfortable if things are behind, um, but, you know, we're at the end of the day, you know, there's a person behind a product, right? And just humanizing that relationship and saying, you know, hey, you know, things got delayed because of X, Y, and Z. I'm really sorry. We're on top of it. This is our plan going forward. And here's how we're going to fix it. Um, and people are really understanding um, and they get it. Uh, and just, you know, keeping that, you know, transparency there and communication there is really helpful. And, uh, and then they'll go out, you know, stronger than they came in. Right. So. Yeah. It, it's, it's interesting. It sounds a little bit like um, the difference between someone who posts something on Facebook or Instagram, you know, once a month and the person who every time they order a sandwich, they're taking <laughs> money. Everyone know how great this avocado sandwich was. You know, if you're not that kind of a person, generally, if you're an introvert or if you're reluctant to or you just don't feel like you have the time or the energy to be that kind of posting every little thing it sounds like you need to encourage your own self to get into that headspace because the more you're talking and the more you're communicating and the more you're actively involved with your crowd, the better your chances of success in a campaign like the one we're talking about. Is that, is that accurate? Yes, that's absolutely accurate. What I did for myself, just because I know that that is a weakness in my personality. Um, I made sure I surrounded myself with a person that I know is a lot more excited about posting stuff like that. And so if I don't have something on my calendar, it doesn't happen. So it doesn't matter whether it's exercise or, you know, uh, eating, if it's not on the calendar, it doesn't happen. Um, so I made sure that we uh, had her scheduled every day uh, to have that communication, even if it's for 15 minutes, so she can go out and do what she needs to do to convey that message. 
Interesting. I wonder what about it? What about bringing on like an influencer to help you with this sort of thing? Sarah, have you seen that kind of thing work where, where you grab an influencer and you say, look, you're, you're the person that I'm not, I need you to do these things for me. So actually my, my experience is crafting original social content for influencers, for the brands that come to them with brand deals. So that is my, my start in the content creating world actually. So I always suggest use an influencer if you can, if you know somebody that's a leader in your space, if you can access them or promote to them what you are doing, if there's a cause that they may may be interested in um, assisting with, it's always a good idea to reach out. So again, that comes with uh, community management of social platforms and consistency. If you commit to reaching out to five influencers a day with the same sort of messaging, see how they reply on the next day, send them a different messaging or send five new influencers a different messaging. Um, just kind of tell them about yourself, tell them about your business, what you're doing, um, ask if they would be interested in uh, collaboration um, or if they would be interested in a sponsored post. So most influencers these days absolutely will jump at the opportunity to do a partnership. Um, so I, I definitely suggest utilize influencers as best as you can. Interesting. I, one of the things that I think about sometimes is when it comes to social media, uh, something written is good. Uh, something mm -hmm. with a photo is better. Something with a video is best, right? People respond to visual content. How important is it to have, say, a sizzle reel or have video of what, what you're doing and who you are? I think it's very important. I think it's especially important as, um, as the founder for you to get in front of the camera, express gratitude for the current traction that you have, with your campaign, with your business, um, it's very important to, like uh, Jessica said, humanize. So that that's exactly what we want to do. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing like really just putting yourself out there to get people to respond to your goals, right? Your dreams, right. Your aspirations, you're communicating directly uh, who you are and how you see this particular thing. And, and it, that that does tend to, you know, be the best way, I guess, to, to get an emotional response from someone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It? And then that can be, you know, repurposed. That same video can be repurposed across social. You can throw it in an email, you can put it on YouTube, anything. So consistency is key. But if you have that one video, that can be used from any kind of aspect of content. And Danny, your expertise in the, in the metrics of this sort of thing, uh, I think it sounds like it would be key. So for example, you do something that you think is awesome and it turns out to be glitchy or the messaging is a little off and you, you put it up there and it doesn't, you know, gets a tepid response. Like that's the kind of thing where you can say, look at these metrics, like this isn't converting to any kind of, you know, any kind of like uh, uh, increase in the number of people who are investing or the number of gifts that you're getting, you know, you, you can try these things out. And so it's not just that you're doing it in a vacuum, you know, you, you do it and you test it and you see if it works. Yes. It's all about testing, you know, without that, you're just going off your assumptions and you want to make sure you have conclusive data, meaning it run enough to know if it's working or not working. Uh, we had a client that used Bill Nye as their brand ambassador. We were running about 2,000 ads a day. Uh, it was raising about 800K a month. Uh, this is for Reg, Reg A+. Plus. Um, but that, that was very powerful. We were targeting Bill Nye's audience with segmented targeting around uh, investor-type personas. So it, it carried a lot of weight where it's not the brand promoting itself. It's another way to leverage that social proof component. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to engage in a, in a brand ambassador role with an influencer and then have a creative of them talking about it, targeting their audience with that, it's going to, it should produce strong results uh, from that, that method. Yeah. And I, and I think about what, what appeals to an audience is not just who you are and what you're doing, um, your goals, ambitions, what the business is about. But isn't it also like conveying, you know, in a sort of branding sense, what the values are? You know, what the core mission is, what the outlook is, whether it's, you know, you care about the environment or you have social issues you care about or that kind of thing. Uh, maybe, maybe Jessica, you can talk a little bit about this, like sort of how important is that brand value uh, to doing a raise and to creating a positive presence in your digital space? It's, 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 I mean, it's like going out into the world and saying, hey, my name is Jessica Baker, but then not sharing anything about you, right? So they're like, that's great. What does that mean to me, right? Why do, why should I care about you? Why is this important to me? You know, figuring out that value proposition for your customer. How are you relevant? How are you going to make a difference in their lives, 
right? So, you know, just, um, just, you know, aligning your interests with them and showing how you can improve their life in one way or another. Um, yeah, that's, that's well said, I think. Yeah, Danny, you're nodding your head on that one. Yes, I, I think Jessica nailed it. You know, the value, what type of value is this going to create? What's the impact? You know, what's the big vision behind it? And that all comes down to the content and the brand voice and the ability to put that out where the offering page is going to touch on that, but that brand voice, the content you put out could really nail that home for those individuals that want that other little piece of info before they invest a higher amount. That's interesting that you're basically talking about sort of a bigger picture, a bigger issue beyond just the product you're selling or the service you're offering, right? So I'm doing this thing for my company, but I also am doing it because I believe in a bigger uh, ideal. I see a vision for the future that, in, that incorporates these different things. Um, that's, that's a, that's a big one. It sounds like, but the better you are at able, the uh, better able you are at, at conveying that, um, the, the sort of the broader, the broader, the appeal, I would think. Yes. Yes. We, we see a lot of these as impact investors. So they're not all looking to get rich off, you know, $500 investment. It's more about being part of something bigger and having that, that big vision of them being uh, excited about that impact that that brand's going to have. Uh, and being able to talk about it, you know, this is all crowdfunding. So being able to share that with their friends, they're then brand ambassadors, their wins, your win, you know, there's, there's that huge impact that you're able to create through that messaging with the content and the ads, as Jessica pointed out, and Sarah, um, that can build a lot more excitement on what they could be a part of. Excellent. Well, this has all been really good. Uh, I think we, it's, I feel like we've sort of addressed a few questions as they've come in. Uh, I, 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 by the way, I wanted to apologize, Sarah, I, I mispronounced your, your name. I, I know it's Bradbury and I think I said Bradley, that's my name, Bradley. So it's, it's on me. I apologize for that, <laughs> but you guys have been great. And I really appreciate all of the experience that you bring to bear on this subject. Um, are there other, um, are there other, uh, questions from the, from the crowd, from our attendees? Uh, if, if not, then, um, we can, uh, I can just sort of open it up to anything else that uh, is important in this, on this issue and the subject matter that we, that we haven't discussed that you'd like to bring up or any little things uh, you think are, are important now that we should uh, be talking about that we haven't talked about. Yeah, I think for me, it's just planning it out, knowing that it's going to be a make or break potentially because the campaigns are so public facing and having fun with it. You know, this is an experience. This is something you could, you know, have a big impact around and, you know, don't look at that as a job. It's something that you can uh, create a lot of uh, community around mm -hmm. and have a big impact, you know, whether it's uh, going to really benefit them financially or, you know, have that bigger vision that you can be a part of. Yeah, my, my feeling on that subject is what, what helps people keep going, you know, when, when they're tired or they had a bad, a bad rough couple of days or something like that. What keeps them going generally is not that we just got a big gift, although that's certainly helpful, or we've just landed an angel investor. That's great. But I think just as important is hearing from somebody. I love what you're doing. Keep going. You know, if somebody who they don't even may, maybe necessarily know, you know, somebody that was introduced to the business by a friend or a supporter and, and they come to you and they say, this is awesome, you know, do it. Right. So I think in a sense, like the, 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 the test of you, of your energy and your ability and your drive, you know, the fun part of it is what makes you, you know, say, yes, I'm going to get up an hour earlier today and see what's happening on my campaign. Yeah. And just to that note, I, I definitely feel like if you're, if you're getting into any business, um, whether it's uh, your small business or raising capital or whatever, you have to really truly believe in it. I mean, it has to, you have to be passionate about it. And if you're not going to be passionate about it, you're going to burn out. Um, it has to be something part of, you know, your core and that you're truly genuinely excited about it because you're going to be, if you're not thinking about it right before you go to sleep or right when you wake up, then maybe you're not as passionate as you think you are. And um, maybe you should look at other things. <laughs> so, yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah, I agree. I'm sure, Sarah, you, you've seen that, right? The, the most successful people on the, on the digital side are people who convey their passion, right? 
convey their commitment. Uh, they let they let know how genuine they are about what they're doing. It's true, absolutely. And again, just everything can be made into content. So anything that you could possibly think that could be a piece of content, it can be. So that is very helpful when going into the daunting aspect of making sure you have content that is consistently being posted. And then on those bad days, if you have a, a scheduling tool that you've already scheduled those few bad days, then you just don't have to worry about content for those days. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. All right, gang. Uh, is there anything else here? Uh, uh, Dan, would you like to weigh in or Rivka, anything that you have thought of that we, uh, we should be addressing at this time? I would just love to hear a little bit more about your companies and maybe share your website so that people can check you guys out a little further. Jessica, do you want to start and then we can go to the DNA folk? Oh, you're muted, Jess. Well, so much for that then, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I'm, I'm Jessica Baker and I have Adeline and Lives Align. Adeline is a white label uh, software as a service uh, that uh, offers teleconferencing billing and scheduling uh, for businesses so that they can streamline customers, add another revenue stream for their business and increase functionality. And then lives align are, are for basically entrepreneurs that maybe don't, um, that want to add additional visibility on our platform. It's basically our live demo of out align. And uh, it allows people to teleconference because I know that in today's world, it's hard to go from, you know, uh, you know, change, change in the pandemic. And so this is our way of uh, trying to give back a little bit. Awesome. And I know we heard a lot about I mean, we got a sense from Danny and Sarah what you guys do, but maybe just a bit about DNA and um, who who DNA would be right for. Yeah, so uh, we incorporated January 2014. Uh, we were working a lot of startup new level businesses and, and funding was a big topic. So that's how we got into running these type of raises. And to date, we've done over 200. We've also worked with 400 brands as a whole on user acquisition. And sometimes we're doing a mix of both at the same time. So driving users and investors at, at just by different funnels. But yeah, we have uh, three main core services on top of a strategy. Uh, content marketing, which, you know, Sarah is uh, in, in the, that process daily. Uh, media buying, which we look at as a more scalable pro approach, driving traffic down that funnel. And then we also have a, a service more on lead generation for strategic partnerships and investor outreach on LinkedIn. And as far as good fits go, I mean, if you guys ever want advice or feedback on, you know, what we're seeing, we're happy to provide, you know, as much information as we can to support with your guys' decision. If you're looking to do a raise or launch a brand, um, and, uh, you know, want to see more wins in the industry as a whole, because then that builds more adaption and more trust to the audience and, you know, excited to, you know, provide any insights we're seeing at any given time. And our site's digitalnicheagency.com. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Well, thanks so much. I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, as always, thank you, Brad, for being an incredible moderator and host. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you guys all for joining us. And we'll be posting this for you guys to use as a resource in the future. So if you didn't get all the notes down, you'll be able to go back. And um, yes, this is a Still New York webinar. We'll be um, posting this in a series on Launch Global TV and on our YouTube page. Thanks so much. Thank you all.